right, uh, Timberly, we're going to give you guys a chance to ask the rest of your questions. So who has the next question for Ms. Elliot? Get my crib shoes. Hi, remember, what's your Hi. name and what's your question? Hi, my name's Will, um, and my question is, did people continue to escape after the wall went up? Yeah, again, a good question. Um, thanks, Will. Uh, they did. They tried. But what happened immediately, the, and again, you can see some photographs in the book, um, the Russians and the East Germans immediately added all the concrete barriers, um, things they called hedgehogs, which were like barbed crosses that people would have to go through, um, uh, search towers. You can see the photograph there. Um, it became, and that became such a, you know, death strip to try to get across. Anybody who tried to rush the wall um, was shot. Now, between 1961 and 1988, um, there were actually 5,000 people who managed to get over it using either, they either dug tunnels um, or they used hot air balloons or they managed to get a pass that they somehow, you know, then hid in things that would cross over the border. Um, they're actually, again, if you go, if you look at the bibliography in my book, for instance, you go to my website, I list some movies that were filmed um, right after um, the wall went up, uh, or right before in the 50s, actually, uh, right when um, Berlin was divided, and you can really see what it looked like. And there's a really good film, um, it's a CBS TV movie, that um, follows a true tunnel digging and the handful of people that got out that way oh, and wow. what they had to do to do it. It's really gripping. Um, for all those who escaped, though, there were just as many or more who didn't make it. There are 600, um, the Ber uh, Berlin city of Berlin has a website, if you're interested, specifically about the war, the wall. Um, and they say that there were 600 um, souls lost at the wall. Either they drowned in the river that was right there, yeah. or they were shot, or they, they committed suicide when they were caught. Oh, so. wow. Yeah, so, I mean, it was a brutal and cruel, I mean, they literally caged their citizens to keep them at, in the country, so. All right, who has the next question? Um, hello, my name is Brian, and my question is, what eventually happened to the Berlin Wall? Hey, Brian, um, it came down and you guys, we are actually talking about it, the 33rd anniversary of that wall going down. There's, your teachers will explain this bet far better because again, it's complicated. Um, but what happened, there was growing um, protests from um, other democracies like ours. Um, there also was pressure from a president called President Reagan um, that coincided with um, a president, a Soviet president, named um, Mikhail Gorbachev, who actually just recently died. And he was fighting to reform Russia and to open it up some more. He's really kind of a hero that we don't hear much about um, anymore, unfortunately. And there was so much pressure and so much um, building, roiling that had been going on for decades now, right, at this point, um, that the East Germans suddenly announced that they were going to take it down. But the Berliners didn't wait. They heard that announcement and they rushed to the wall. And they and it happened today. Yes, today, you guys. <laughs> this today is the 33rd anniversary. Today is the 33rd anniversary. And they literally took it down with sledgehammers in their bare hands. And you brought something and today for us to see, I right? I do. I have a very dear friend who is the narrator of the audiobook, which, you guys, is extraordinary because she can speak Russian, she can speak German, she's amazing. And she gave this to me. Oh, wow. For my birthday recently. What is this? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a piece of the wall. You can see some of the concrete on the back, right? And it's just one chip of that horrible cage. And the graffiti we can see. Yeah, you can see from the photograph that you had, this is a little bit of green paint that would have been graffiti. I have to tell you, I feel like I am holding souls in my hand when I, you know, this is an artifact, you guys, primary document kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So. All right, well, I think we have one more question from our students. Hi, who has the next question? Hi, I'm Oscar. Hey, Oscar. What were some lessons we learned from this period of time? 
have we had a chance to improve? You know, I think there's always an an arc toward growth among we humans. There's a writer named um, uh, Steinbeck, who's one of my favorite writers, who says that a writer has to believe in the perfectibility of man. Not that we're there yet, but that it's possible. So I'm sorry, that's the answer to the last part of your question. Um, there's so many things that we can learn from this, but here's the primary one I want you guys to think about, because you're smart, okay? I want you to think for yourselves. I want you to listen I want you to open your heart to people who maybe are a little unlike you or may say things that don't make sense to you at first, um, and to form your own opinion about people and politics and things in general. Don't buy into stereotypes. Don't buy into hate labels or disinformation or propaganda and spin because you guys are really smart. Ask yourself, is what you're reading, does it make sense? Does it feel right, right? Um, and I guess, you know, I think I just said logic is one of the really best tools against, you know, disinformation and stuff that isn't true and spin propaganda. Propaganda is taking a little kernel of truth and, and using it to forward a cause or a political leader or, you know, something that you want other people to buy into. Um, you know, don't fall into mob mentality, right? Ooh, and there we have a good, a good explanation of it. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, and let history, if, is it all right for me to kind of talk about some of the parallels between sure. Berlin and 1960 and now? History, you guys, I want you to remember this about history too, please. History is a human drama. It's not just dates and times and battles and, you know, you know, things that you have to regurgitate for your tests, for your SOLs. It's a story of how we've become who we are and why, right? Story of people. Yes, and we've always tried to make sense, all the way back to caveman's time, we've tried to make sense of ourselves by telling story and looking at experiences and things that have happened for parable, which is lessons, okay? Um, so history, even just a little bit of it, will help you understand more of like the, the stuff that's going on today because we adults talk about stuff all the time and sometimes you guys don't have the context for it, right? So for instance, um, going on in what's going on in Ukraine right now, I'm just gonna turn to my notes too here for just a second to make sure I kind of stick to what I wanna say to you on that. Take for example, what's happening there right now and a little bit of what you've now learned about Berlin. Ah, thank you, okay? The incursion that Russia has brought onto Ukraine and the war that you guys are hearing a lot about. And I know you're kind of saying, what is the Cold War, right? Well, we talked about that a little bit today. Think back to what we were just talking about in Berlin. From the moment that NATO was formed in reaction to Russia's aggression, both in Eastern Europe after taking over all those satellite countries after World War II and then trying to take over Berlin, you know, um, we formed NATO, but Russia immediately begins claiming that NATO is the aggressor, that NATO is who wants to actually invade East Germany and undo their workers' utopia. You know, one of the things about disinformation is redirect and accusing somebody else of doing what actually you're doing. So, all right. So, and remember that that propaganda, that NATO's the one that's threatening us, that's why we have to build a wall, is how they convinced a lot of East Germans just to accept this barbed wire, 27 miles of barrier that went up overnight without any warning that they were just supposed to accept. Um, Putin, right now, has claimed that the reason they're invading, and there's a picture of him when he was young, I'll start by saying he was a KGB officer, which was the secret police of Soviet Russia, like the German Stasi, as a young man, KGB officer, in East Germany. His job specifically was to look for dissidents, people who might write differing opinions, who might try to tell you what they re what really is reality, what they really know. He looked for people like that to arrest and send to jail. He also was in charge of trying to turn to coerce people who had made it over to the West to give him information about NATO's military secrets. Okay, so he's kind of had it out for NATO for a long time. When he first went into, you may have heard some of this stuff, when they first invaded um, Ukraine, Putin was claiming that 
it was because Ukraine threatened Russian sovereignty because they wanted to join NATO. Um, he's also claimed that it's a denazifying campaign and that all these reported, you know, kind of horrors, the executions, the interrogations that are so brutal, starving kids who have been trapped inside, you know, bombed out hospitals, I think it was, that that was actually being staged by the victims. Does this make sense to you guys? But these are the kind of disinformation tactics that he learned as a KGB officer. And the thing is, is that those things will often be, have a little teeny tiny kernel of truth that you have to kind of think, that doesn't make sense to me. Know that a dissident who was writing about Putin when he came in, he said he's a typical KGB officer. If it's snowing, they will calmly stand there and tell you that the sun is shining. Um, last thing I'll just tell you. I mentioned a man named Khrushchev um, who went toe-to-toe -to -toe and head-to-head -to -head right. with, with Kennedy um, and was really pushing to, um, for the wall and also to take over Berlin, all of West Berlin, um, into uh, their Soviet bloc or into the, I'm sorry, into East Germany, which they influenced, we shall say. Um, Khrushchev um, bragged that he had influenced the election between Nixon and Kennedy. He also had this quote, which was, um, we will take America without firing a shot. We do not have to invade the United States. We will simply destroy you from within by sowing disagreement among Americans, by helping to divide Americans, by fueling conspiracy theories, by trying to say that, you know, some, that group over there is really trying to undo this group over here. Um, so. Which is why it's so important to have a book like you've written. Oh, it's so <laughs> I hope important so. <laughs> to have, to give students real examples of research and how, and how it's so important that they make the decisions about their own lives, that they, they learn to write questions, they learn to question everything, and that they can make those, those decisions so that they can live the life that they want to live. Yes. And I have such faith in you all. You guys are smart, and you are open-minded, and you still have that righteous indignation right now. Hang on to that, all right, and question things. Use that fuel. Yeah, use it and think. Um, and I'm, I want to hear what you're thinking. I really do. And so. once again, a great way to do that is by reading historical fiction novels. Yes. <laughs> reading widely will give you lots of perspectives about the world. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Timberland. You guys were wonderful. Great questions. I was so impressed.